So, welcome everybody. So, my last Gresham lecture of the year is going to be not so much about astronomy. I'm going to change the tack a little bit, and it's called atmospheric phenomena. Now, it won't be a surprise that I, as an astronomer, keep an eye on the sky the whole time. I'm just kind of monitoring what, the, what it's like, whether I might see any stars tonight, what the sky's like. But it's not just that astronomer in me. I'm interested in the sky for a number of reasons. Of course, when you are at a professional telescope, you spend a lot of time, you know, in the evening watching the sky, wondering whether it's ever going to clear, and you're ever going to get any... <laughs> you know, all the photos I have from telescopes always when it's really manky weather, because otherwise I'll be sitting in the telescope. Um, so here, for example, you're right at the top of Mauna Kea, and you're looking across to the other end of the island, and this is not uh, the sea, this is the cloud level. You're at 14,000 feet up. And the thing about mountaintops is they're brilliant places to observe some of the atmospheric phenomena that I'm talking about. Because you're high up and you're looking through a lot of air and a lot of the atmosphere, and a lot of these effects I'm going to talk about are very easily seen. And it's also not, you don't just have to be on top of a mountain to see most of these phenomena. Again, maybe it's because I live in Cambridgeshire where you can't escape the wide open sky. But I'm willing to bet that you will have seen many of the the features and effects that I'm talking about today, maybe you didn't look, them, look at them particularly closely. I'm hoping that maybe next time you see them, you'll look at them in a bit more detail and have a clearer eye of what you're seeing. Some of these you may never have thought about. Some of these you will see quite regularly. But other things are really rare, and you're lucky if you see them once or twice in your lifetime. And I want you to be able to recognise those when, when you actually observe them. And many of these effects are predictable. They happen every clear night, uh, every clear evening. Other ones need very particular atmospheric conditions. But all of them are fantastic examples of physics in action. Because all you're dealing with is you've got starlight, you've got sunlight, you've got moonlight. It falls on the Earth's atmosphere. And then it's what happens when it interacts with that atmosphere. The light gets diffracted, it gets dispersed, it gets refracted. It, gets, uh, it interferes, it gets attenuated, it gets absorbed. There are all these things that happen within our atmosphere and they give you these wonderful examples of physical processes and create in the process these spectacular, most beautiful um, effects in the sky. So to start off with, you know, the most obvious light in our sky is our sun. So this is just everyday predictable effects. The sun is the dominant source of light in our sky. And for those who've been to my previous lectures, you know that we don't receive all the light from the sun. Things like the ultraviolet, the x-rays, never make it through our atmosphere anywhere near to the ground level. But most of the sun's radiation, the dominant uh, part of the sun's radiation, comes in the visible and the near-infrared. But very little of that really makes it to the ground. A lot of the sun's radiation is lost by principally two processes. The first one is absorption by water vapour. There's huge amounts of water vapour within our atmosphere, something like 10 million million tonnes within our atmosphere. And that will remove some of the energy from the sunlight, principally over to more the red wavelengths. And if you absorb sunlight, you remove the energy from the sunlight, it goes into heating the molecules, and maybe it'll be re-radiated in the infrared. But the point is, you've removed the visible sunlight, and you've turned it into some radiation that we can't detect and we can't see. And in fact, it's a real pain for infrared astronomers, because it makes the infrared sky glow. So you've removed energy from the sunlight. So this is an attenuation. And everywhere you see the sun, this energy has been lost. It happens mainly in the red wave band, so if there's a lot of water vapour in the atmosphere, a lot more of the red light gets removed from the, the sunlight. And there are stories, of, stories about if you're in a really heavy rainstorm, sometimes the sky can even seem greenish because you've got these rain bands. A lot of the red light has been removed from the spectrum. So you have water vapour absorption, and that removes a huge amount of light in the atmosphere. <coughs> The other thing is not so much absorption, but a redirection of the light through scattering. And this is by a process called Rayleigh scattering. The incoming photons come and scatter, literally bounce off the molecules in the air. And so when you see the sunlight coming through, it intersects with those air molecules and redirects the light. And the key thing about Rayleigh scattering is that a particle will scatter light 
that's smaller, it got a smaller wavelength than the size of the particles. So for the air molecules, they're very efficient at scattering short wavelength light, so blue light. In fact, if you want to look at the equation, the probability of a photon undergoing a scattering with an air molecule goes as the inverse of its wavelength fourth. Okay, that's going to be the only equation, by the way, so don't panic. All this means is that the shorter the wavelength, much higher probability that the light is going to interact with the photon. So even between the blue end and the red end of the visible spectrum, so that's between 450 nanometers to 650 nanometers, blue light is three times more likely to be scattered than the red light. So that's when you, you know, when you look up in the sky, the sky is blue, and you're seeing all this blue light that's been redirected from the other paths of the sun into the atmosphere. Of course, other wavelengths of light are scattered, but it's the blue that predominates from the air molecules. So that's our blue sky, but even then there are variations within this blue sky due to the Rayleigh scattering. And this is something you can observe. I observed it this morning on my train into London. There's a variation in brightness in the blue of the sky. It's darker and bluer up at the top. It's whiter and brighter down below. And just to show, I've got this image of a strip through the sky, and if I turn it round... Hopefully you can see the contrast. And that's because when you look up, you're looking, through less, you're looking through a less depth of air. There are fewer air molecules, there are fewer scatterings, and so the light is fainter and the blue predominates. But as you look down, you're looking through deeper and deeper through the air, you're seeing far more scatterings, and so the light is brighter. But because the more, you know, the more air molecules there are, high probability that all photons will be scattered, even the redder ones. And you start to revert back to the colour of the sunlight. You start to get the more yellowy, brighter, whiter colours down towards the horizon. And indeed, you can see this variation every day goes white down to the horizon. So even the blue sky shows quite a bit of difference. And of course, if you don't have any sky at all, you don't get you know, any atmosphere, you don't get any blue sky. So that's why it's completely dark on the moon. No atmosphere to scatter the light, the sky is completely black. And many of the, like this effect, many of the phenomena I'm talking about are seen better or are more predominant or stronger the larger the length of air you see them through because it's interaction with what's in our atmosphere. And astronomers have a way of quantifying this. They call it air mass. And the minimum air mass you can see is when you look directly overhead to the zenith, and we call that an air mass of one. And then as you go down subsequent angles, you're looking through more and more amounts of atmosphere. And all the effects I'm talking about that interfere with the light increase the further down you look, because you're looking through more, a longer length through the atmosphere. So this will be an air mass of two, an air mass of three, an air mass of four. And it increases quite rapidly with angle from the zenith. We call this the zenith distance, so how far you are away from the zenith. And it climbs as the secant of the zenith. So if you want to plot, here you are. The further you go down from overhead, the way the air mass increases until when you're looking horizontally, you're looking through 38 air masses. Remember, it's not just the height of air, but air is more concentrated, or you've got denser air closer to the Earth, and so the effect gets accentuated. So when you look along the horizon, you're looking through an awful lot more air than when you're looking overhead. So this, for example, is you know, a good reason for putting telescopes on mountaintops, of course, because you're already higher up, so you're looking through the less dense air, and you're also... Um, so you've risen above the sort of denser gradients of air, and you're going to get less of these atmospheric effects. However, in terms of the atmospheric phenomena that I'm going to talk about, the weather phenomena today, if you're up a mountain, you can even see through more air masses than this because the Earth is curved. Of course, this, isn't, this next plot isn't to scale. I haven't really got mountains quite that large. But you can see if you're on top of a mountain, if you're looking horizontally, because of that extra elevation, you can get above 38 air masses. And so, again, this is why they're such good places. You get all these effects accentuated. So by the time you're seeing the sun down at the horizon, you're looking through a larger air mass, you've lost a lot of the blue light, so the sun appears redder through the scattering. The absorption as well has removed light from the sun. Again, that happens more through the deeper uh, sight line through the atmosphere. So the sun always appears dimmer and it always appears redder at sunset. Of course, professionally, I cannot recommend anybody ever looks at the sun under any circumstances, but you will have noticed it is dimmer and redder at sunset, and you can look at it, and it's not going to dazzle you. 
And that's just because all this light has been lost from the sun. And there are other effects that can accentuate this, this loss of light. If you've got other particles in the air, they can also provide this scattering. I've only talked about air molecule scattering so far. If you've got dust, say from volcanic explosion, or you've got pollen, or you might have aerosols in the air, they're also going to contribute to the scattering. And that's where you get much redder sunsets and sunrises after a volcanic explosion if there's that layer of fine dust particles in the air. But because these particles are bigger, they're scattering a wider wave wavelength of light, so more colours. And they don't scatter them in all random directions. So imagine you have an incoming ray of light. It collides with your air molecule. This is the Rayleigh scattering that produces the blue sky. It's fairly symmetric, because air molecules are fairly symmetric. It goes in every which direction. But as soon as you start getting two particles that are more than, say, a tenth of the wavelength of light, this scattering is not uniform. The particles are not necessarily symmetric. And the larger the particle and the more asymmetric it is, you develop something called me scattering, slightly different. The key characteristic of, of it is the light doesn't go symmetrically. It tends to become progressively forward scattered or back scattered. So if the light comes in, hits the particle, it is scattered more into the forward direction and then gets accentuated in um, the same direction as the, the light came in. And this me scattering, again, is particularly prominent if you've got any other particulate matter in the atmosphere. So another very simple observation. If you obscure, yeah, I've told you how the sky gets darker the higher up you, you look up in the sky. But if you look around the sun, so block out the sun with a convenient lamppost or your fist, you will find that unless you've got really exceptionally clear skies, there will be what's called an aureole. There's a white haze of light around the sun. And it's particularly pronounced if there's a lot of particulate matter within the atmosphere. And this is light that comes in from the sun, gets scattered by these large particles, and then gets redirected and enhanced towards you. So you get this enhancement of light. It's not scattered into random directions. It's kind of scattered more towards you. And so you get this fuzzy white light around the sun. And because it affects all wavelengths of light equally, it's the same colour as the sun. And so again, that's a very simple test for how clear your atmosphere might be and how much of this junk is sitting there in the air. So <clears throat> you have scattering of light. And then there are many other processes that are going on. So that's scattering. We also have a process called refraction. Now I've talked about refraction a bit for those of you who were here when I did my telescopes lecture. And talking about how lenses work in telescopes or in any circumstance, which is that they bend the light around. As light goes from uh, materials of different density, say from air into glass or from air into water, it, the speed of light changes and this has a net effect of bending and skewing the light round, bends the light ray. Now, and if you have enough variations in the density of air, you will also get it acting like a lens. So imagine you've got very stratified air. So you've perhaps got circumstances, you've seen this where you have a, a hot tarmac road or a very dark, you know, very hot desert floor. The air just above it is heated up and then there are cool, cooler layers further up. So the light is always bent, so it goes to the denser, the cooler air. And so if you have light rays coming from the sky that should be coming towards you, well, they do come towards the other light rays that are directed elsewhere that would normally be absorbed by the ground. They get bent round successively up towards, and you get that light as well. And it's a trick, it's a mirage. If you followed the line of sight, you think it's coming from down there, and you see this bright skylight appearing as if it's on the road. This is your standard desert mirage. This is how you see puddles of water on a hot tarmac road or apparently in... Um, in the desert. So this is a, a manifestation of that refraction of the air. Now, this is a very particular circumstance. What you have to realise is this refraction goes on all the time. It affects all the light that comes into our atmosphere. And for the sun, the sun is so large that you begin to see a difference of refraction even over the diameter of the sun. In other words, that the top is less refracted than the bottom, because the bottom you're seeing through a larger air mass than the top. So <clears throat> as the sun sets, by the time you're getting horizontal, this refraction is so great 
that in fact you are seeing the sun when it's already behind, below the horizon. So for example here, here's the sun, if you've, it's really over our horizon, but if you follow the curve light rays, we have the illusion that it's actually up there. And so the sun, by the time the, sun's kissing, the bottom of the sun's kissing the horizon, in reality the whole of the sun is below the horizon. And this is true for all the stars that we see in the sky. It also predicts, I mean, for the stars, it just shifts their position. But things like the sun and the moon that are extended, because you've got this differential diffraction, sorry, refraction from the bottom to the top, the bottom is more refracted than the top. So the light rays from the bottom are lifted up more than the ones from the top, which has a net effect of squashing the sun, making it look more oblate, more oval-shaped. And I'm sure you've seen this effect, this squashed sun. It can be accentuated if you've got particular atmospheric conditions. And it's particularly strong, again, the higher up you are, you're looking through more layers of the Earth's atmosphere. So by the time you get out to space, you get moonrise over the Earth's atmosphere and through the Earth's atmosphere, where it can be incredibly squashed. So the sun usually gets squashed by about 20%, the moon up to about 40%. And this is a picture of the moonrise taken from the International Space Station. So that is ordinary refraction. Now, refraction doesn't affect all colours of light equally. Blue light gets dispersed more than red light. So it's the same process where you put light through a prism and you get the spectrum out of the different colours. Here, it's the same thing. Light comes in and according to the colour, thing, the light rays are just kind of dispersed from the white. So if you have a star, you have the blue, green and red images are all slightly displaced from each other. They overlap. So when you look at your star, you've got your main white star, and it's maybe got a little blue fringe and a red fringe at the bottom. And this is where we have to be careful as astronomers. We do a lot of observations where we put just a tiny aperture over a star. So here's a star showing that diffraction and dispersion of the colour. If we want to just isolate that star's spectrum, you need to know exactly how this dispersion is behaving, because if you put your slit to gather the light horizontally, you're going to miss some of the light from the star. You're going to get your data are going to be wrong. So this is something we have to take into account. How, you know, how big is this dispersion of colours? What direction is it? We put our slit in the correct direction. And it's something we monitor all the time. And that's why astronomers always want to observe things as close to the zenith as possible so they don't get this dispersion of colours and it doesn't muck up their data. And dispersion affects stars as well because through constant movements of the air. You're familiar with the phenomena of stars twinkling in the night sky. This is refraction. The star is effectively a point source. Its light has to travel through our atmosphere, but if our atmosphere is moving around, maybe it's, it's not uniform. You've got little pockets of less dense or more dense or lower or cooler air, and they're moving around. The light comes in and it moves through those cells and it can cause momentary refractions, which just change the direction of the light, bends the light rays. And so if you're just looking at the star, the light rays you're looking at continue being, you know, from different pockets of air get moved into or away from your line of sight, especially if that air is moving around, there's microturbulence. This causes the star to fluctuate in brightness, which is the twinkling. It'll also seem to sparkle and flash with different colours because of the dispersion, the refraction uh, um, produces. So you're all very familiar with perhaps Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. You'll see it coming into our skies um, in the next, next few months, new few weeks. From the UK, we always see that low down in the atmosphere. You're seeing it through a large amount of air mass. And so the effect is very pronounced, this sparkling and flashing, this twinkling. And it's interesting that one way you can tell a planet from a star with the unaided eye is that planets don't twinkle. Stars do, because you've got a point source of light. The light from a planet, even though you can't see it with your eyes, comes from a tiny extended disk. And the same way that some of that light from that disk may be refracted out and away from you, other light could be refracted in. And over the whole planet disk, there's net effect is it doesn't actually fluctuate in brightness. And so when you're out there and you want to distinguish between stars and planets, look for the twinkling or not. But again, the more atmosphere you look through, the worse this effect is. It's another argument for putting telescopes up on mountaintops because you're looking through less of the atmosphere. Because if your star's twinkling, it's blurring out the images. And so, of course, the very best science, very best images, is if you put your telescope on orbit outside the atmosphere and you get none of this twinkling. And that's why 
things like the Hubble Space Telescope are so fantastic. It's not intrinsically a huge telescope, but you don't have all that blurring due to the atmosphere, due to the refraction in the atmosphere, and your observations can be that much clearer. So all of that's predictable, but if you combine that dispersion with particular atmosphere, you know, atmospheric conditions, you can get some very interesting refraction effects, particularly at sunset, again, because you're looking through such an air mass. So here you have a sun rising, and you have the same mirage. The light rays from the sun go down and bend round. If I just go back, we can watch that again. And they create a mirage sun below the lower one, and as the sun rises up, the image begins to separate. And this is called an omega sunrise or sunset, because you've got that nice Greek omega shape. And this is a mirage. So not only is the sun squashed, but if you've got sort of stratified densities of air, you've got this refraction that affects the shape of the sun. So a normal density gradient will give you just your flattened sun. As soon as you get layers, so perhaps you might have a warm layer that's covered up by cold layers, that gives you the omega-shaped um, sunrise, or you, maybe you've got another inversion where you've got warmer layers overlying cold air and you get much more stratified effects. It's always laterally symmetric and you get a Chinese lantern type of sunset. And so these are very particular and often best observed at coastal regions where you tend to get the flow of air from the hot land to the cold sea or vice versa to get those stratified um, density variations. And here, of course, it's not really what the temperature and the density of the atmosphere is. It's the way it changes with height from the ground that, correct, that produces these mirages. And, of course, one of the most famous mirages that's ever seen is called the green flash. It's best seen when you have a nice, clear horizon and, you know, perhaps over sea, over clouds, so mountaintops are good. And you just catch the very last rays of the sun. As it sinks below the horizon, it'll flash vividly green for about a second or two. So here's a little movie. Oh, well, okay, let me explain and I'll show you the movie. So again, this is the dispersion of the sunlight. Now, the same as the stars, the blue, um, green and red images of the sun are all slightly displaced from each other. Now, of course, by the time you get to sunset, you've lost a lot of the, the blue light, and so the sun appears redder. And not just that, because you've lost a lot of the blue light, you're just more or less looking at the displacement between the green and the red images. Now, you cannot resolve this sliver of green or the sliver of red underneath the sun with the unaided eye. If you could, you would see a green flash every night. These are comparatively rare. You need to combine this dispersion of colours in the sun at sunset with one of those mirages that magnifies the effect and then it kicks it into suddenly being visible and apparent to the unaided eye. So <clears throat> here we have an example of the sun setting down and just watch for those last rays of light suddenly flashing this green colour. And when you do observe it, it's completely unmistakable. You know you've seen it. And if you're really, really lucky, and there isn't much scattering, you can even see a blue flash, and that's far rarer. But that is, again, the combination of this refraction and the mirage. So, again, it helps to be at sea coastal regions where you might have those temperature inversions that produce the, the mirages. So once the sun set, we move into twilight. And I bet you didn't know there are three kinds of twilight. And twilight just defines when it's not dark, it's not completely dark and it's not completely light. The sun's set below the horizon, but it's still lighting up the air above you, so there's still a lot of light coming down. And so the first part, for the time it takes for the sun to go below um, from zero down to about minus six degrees, so six degrees below the horizon, that's called civil twilight. There's so much scattering in the, in the air, it's still quite light. You don't need artificial lighting outdoors, though you're still supposed to put on your headlights by then. But it's still, you know, there's a lot of light around. But after about six degrees, the sun sinks lower, the light from the sky fades, you're going to start needing some outdoors light. And this is known as nautical twilight because you have the combination of the first and brightest stars are out, but if you're at sea, you can still see a clear horizon. So historically, it's the time for taking those navigational measurements you might need at sea, at sea hence the name nautical twilight. But after that, you can no longer see the horizon, you need artificial lighting, 
but not, it's not completely dark, and that's astronomical twilight, and that's the time we do all our preparation at the telescopes, all the calibration, getting the telescope ready. And once the sun's set below 18 degrees, that's when night begins. And of course, you know, it depends uh, what time of year, but in the UK, by the time you get to June and July, there's virtually no official night. Most of the night is astronomical twilight, because it depends how low the sun is down in the below the horizon. And there are lots of things you can see in twilight, but before I can explain those, I just want to talk a bit about rays and beams of sunlight. Now, we've all seen this effect. Sometimes they're called Jacob's Ladders. So we have beams of light that stretch up in towards the sun. And the sun's usually obscured by a thick blank of cloud. And where there are holes in the cloud, the sunlight comes through and produces these sunbeams. The dark shafts are where the, the clouds are blocking out the sunlight. And so it's the shadows of the clouds. And these beams always stretch back towards the sun and they're brighter down towards the ground. Now, they're bright because the, the air that's being lit up by the sun has got particles in. You've got that scattering and it tends to scatter the sunlight towards you. And that's how you see that light. And what you have to realise is the light, the light beams are um, from the sunlight and scattering the light. The dark beams are shadows. Now, we tend to think of shadows as something two-dimensional. I want you to think about shadows as something three-dimensional. Because if I hold my hand up, it's casting a shadow through a volume of space behind it. It only manifests itself into a shadow when you put something in the way that the shadow falls on. And then it's that sort of dark and flat thing we think of as a shadow. So when you get... Um, OK, some of these effects are quite difficult to photograph, let alone get onto a screen. Maybe you can see. You get this cloud here is casting... Ray, um, shadows that stretch across the sky. So these are three-dimensional beams. These are three-dimensional shadows that stretch right across. And they all seem to converge on the sun because it's a matter of perspective. The sun is 150 million kilometres away. To our eyes, that's more or less at infinity. You're looking at a whole lot of parallel beams from the sun that are converging into the distance. In the same way, the railway track to one side and the other, even though it's parallel, will converge to a point and converge to a point either side of you. It's the same with the sun rays. They all converge back towards the sun and widen towards you. And you are in practice looking along these sun rays. Remember, the me scattering produces light going forward. And so it's enhanced when the sun's low in the sky and you're looking almost along these sunbeams, you get more of this bright light directed towards you. And these are known as crepuscular rays, where you've got the combination of light rays and dark shadows across the sky. Now, they pass, again, three-dimensional shadows. They pass overhead. They tend to fade out there because there isn't much side scattering, and so they're not lit up. But by the time they go to the other part of the sky, the anti-solar point, again, you're looking along the beams, and you still get the scattering. And these, again, haven't come out very well in these slides, I'm afraid. But you get the anti-crepuscular anti rays on the other side of the sky. Maybe you can see dark shadows just sort of converging in the distance. So those, again, are unique to sunset. Other shadows you can see in the sky, mountain shadows. Now, here you have a very triangular shadow of Mauna Kea cast across the sky. Now, Mauna Kea is an extinct volcano. It's quite a triangular mountain. But it doesn't matter what mountain you stand on, you always get a triangular shadow. And again, it's a matter of perspective. It's not just a clean shadow, you know, on a screen straight behind it. You are standing on top of a long three-dimensional um, tunnel of unlit air. And as, you know, these shadows can be hundreds of miles long from a tall enough mountain, and you're basically looking along that unlit air, and it converges in the distance to form this, this effect of a conical shadow. And so whatever the shape of the mountain, you always get a triangular shadow. And so you're here, and you're just looking along here, and you're seeing it converging in the distance. So mountain shadows, again, are projected across the, uh, across the cloud below you. And then there's an even bigger shadow, which you can see most nights when it's clear. And that's the shadow not of the mountain you're standing on, but of the Earth itself. So as the sun sets in the sky, if you turn around to the east, you will begin to see a large band. It stretches from the north down to the south, and it's highest in the east, and as the sun goes down, it rises up across the sky. It's the belt of Venus, or in other words, it's the Earth's shadow cast onto the sky. It's a curved shadow, and as the sun goes down, the shadow tilts up. 
it's usually pink across the top. It doesn't really come out here, but it, you have pink across the top where there's still scattering within the atmosphere producing the pink light. And then you've got this bluey band of the Earth's shadow. And it gets less and less distinct when it's about 10, 15 degrees up, it kind of vanishes. But you can observe that most clear nights. So those are shadows. Now I'm going to talk about light rays. And I've talked about what happens when you encounter air molecules or dust particles or other particular matter. But of course, there's water droplets everywhere in our atmosphere. And one of the clearest atmospheric phenomena we see on an everyday basis are rainbow. Well, yeah, actually, given the last month's weather, probably on an everyday basis, are rainbows. But there are rainbows, and then there are all kinds of other rainbows. And again, if curious, everybody might recognise your stand, bog standard primary rainbow, but not recognise some of these other types of rainbows I'm also going to mention. So a rainbow happens if you have raindrops and you have bright sun. The brighter the sun, the, uh, the brighter the rainbow. The lower down the sun, the more intense the rainbow. The bigger the raindrop, the more intense the colours. And they happen preferentially, where, well, they'll only happen when the sun is relatively low down in the sky. So for a rainbow to be produced, the sunlight comes into a raindrop. So here's your raindrop. The sunlight is instant on the surface. Okay, sun is reflected, but sun passes through the raindrop. Now it's moving from air to water. You've got refraction. The colours get dispersed a little. Within the raindrop... You then have a, clip, you have a reflection on the back side of the raindrop and then you have a further dispersion of light as it again moves from water to air. So you have a combination of two refractions that spread the light, incoming sunlight. You also have a reflection that turns the light back round. So this is why when you have the sun behind you, the rainbow always op is opposite because it's been turned round and redirected towards your eye and the colours are from the dispersion of the refraction. But it's not that you see this, all the colours from all the raindrops. And you have a very particular thing. Every rainbow is unique to any particular vantage point. Imagine you've got raindrops high in the air and low in the air, and I'm standing over here somewhere. The light coming in is dispersed in slightly different directions. So if I'm over here... If I've got a raindrop really high up, the light comes in and it gets dispersed. But it's only the red light from the high raindrops that happens to be directed towards my eye. The other colours are dispersed, but they, all those rays are passing over me. I'm missing them. But then if you've got a raindrop that's much lower, well, I'll not, oh, sorry, I'll not see the red light from it, but I'll see the violet light from it. And so you get this dispersion of colour according to where the raindrop is in the sky. You see one colour from each raindrop, but you have a continuum of behaviour about which colour it is you see from each raindrop. And so that's why you always see the red from all the raindrops high in the sky and the violet from the lower down raindrops. And it also means that everybody sees a different raindrop and the raindrop moves with you. I don't know if you've done this, you're driving along in the car, or hopefully someone else is driving you in the car and you're observing the rainbow. And you notice it travels with you, it tracks you. It's not like it's in a fixed place in the sky, but it actually moves alongside you, which can be unnerving when you start to notice it. So the rainbow is, everybody's rainbow is different. Okay, this really hasn't come out well, but I just want to remind you, of course, that if you have a setting sun, you don't have much blue light, and you get red rainbows. So there's no blue light, and you only get the red and the orange refractions of the light. And so you get very uh, special red rainbows when the, sky is, um, the sun is heavily reddened. And there's another phenomenon where you have the combination of those sunbeams, those rays of sun, and the raindrops. And you only get, the, you only get the, the rainbow when you have the interaction of the sun when it falls on the water. And if the sun is coming out and those beams, those crepuscular rays, you only get the rainbow where those intersect the raindrops. And you get something called a rainbow wheel where you can just get distinct blotchy patches of rainbow. And that's why you sometimes usually just see not the entire rainbow, but just a little burst of rainbow in the sky that would be where the arc is. It just happens to be where a sunbeam is cutting that cloud of rain. And sometimes, this is a lovely rainbow, quite rare to see. You've got the lower rainbow, which is created by the sunlight coming directly into the raindrops. But then the sunlight, which has bounced off the water surface, and then interacted with the raindrops. Because it's coming at a lower angle, it's 
uh, hit it, you know, it's the rainbow is produced at a different angle, at a higher angle. So you have both the ordinary raindrop and you have a reflection, so ordinary rainbow, primary rainbow, and you get a reflection bow, which is higher. And this is not the secondary rainbow you normally see because the colours are still dispersed in the same way. It's just from the light coming at a certain direction. And of course, the, rain, the arc of the rainbow is 42 degrees. So the sunlight would come in um, like this, and then the rainbow is dispersed 42 degrees from the opposite side of the sky to the sun. So if the sun is very high in the sky, if it's more than 42 degrees high in the sky, your rainbow would be below the horizon. So you need the sun to be sufficiently low that the rainbow raises up to be visible. And so again, it tends to be preferentially when the sun is lower in the sky, so in winter, in the morning, or in the afternoon. But there isn't just one rainbow. If you're very lucky, and the raindrops are large, there are a lot of them, you get a secondary rainbow. And this is different from the reflection rainbow I just showed you because the colours are reversed. You can see the ordinary rainbow has red on the outside, blue in the centre. You probably can't see this, but maybe you see in other pictures, you have red on the inside going to blue on the outside. And this is just about 10 degrees further out. And this is the same sunlight interacting in the same raindrops. But instead of just coming in being refracted, one reflection being refracted, the sunlight comes in, it's refracted, it's reflected, it's reflected and refracted, so it gets turned around more. You lose more light in the process, which is why the secondary rainbow is fainter, but it's dispersed at a wider range of angles and further out. And so the light is turned round and upside down, and that's why the colours are reversed. And interestingly, there's a no man's light where no light is scattered. If I just slide, if that's the furthest the light is refracted, Okay, between the violet and the red, and similarly the rays from the secondary um, reflection only emerge in that direction. If I just slide that arrow across, you see there's a region of sky where no light is scattered by the raindrops. And so there's this region of dark between the primary and the secondary here. That's called Alexander's Dark Band, and it lies, sometimes you can see it very clearly, and it just means no light has been directed into there. You can see there's light within here and light here, but you get this dark band. And if you're very lucky, you don't just see the primary rainbow and the secondary rainbow. There are other effects called the supernumeraries. Again, they tend to happen right at the top of the arch. And this is when you've got a very fine mist of raindrops and you get interference between the different uh, light produced by the refractions. And what happens is that light will enter along slightly different paths, take different paths through the raindrop. And, but they'll be so... Um, they'll come out slightly different in wavelength and the colours will interfere and then combine. So if you've got the, the red, red light from one uh, refraction, reflection, it interfere with the blue light from another refraction and reflection, they'll combine to get purple. And so you have this interference of colours which produces typical pinks and purples and greens. And that's always a characteristic of these rainbows. They don't show the colours, just these very particular interference colours. And, okay, so here's a combination. You've got the interference band, you've got the secondary rainbow, and you've got the primary rainbow. Beautiful picture. Now, by the time your water droplets get really tiny, you're scattering, you're, you're kind of going to scattering rather than refraction. You're going back to that particles bouncing off, um, sorry, photons bouncing off the particles, and all wavelengths of, being, of light being dispersed. And so you can get a fog bow, which is so faint, I bet you can barely see it, but you have to believe me, it's there. Okay. Uh, there's so much light being dispersed, it's a very faint bow in the sky. Similarly, you can get a moon bow, but because the moon's like a million times fainter than the, the sunlight, it's, you don't tend to pick up the colours, and it's a very sort of diffuse dark in the sky. It's the same process. But here, you're dealing with scattering, and rather, again, back scattering towards you, rather than pure reflection and refraction, and you don't get the colours that way. So as soon as you have a mist between you and the sun or the moon, you get a phenomenon called uh, coroni. Here are some photos I took just last week. There was, I think it was on the Tuesday or Wednesday night. Beautiful, just thin mist in between us and the moon. And you get this dispersion due to scattering of colours. And first of all, it starts with a sort of ring around the moon that's slightly sort of got a, a reddish edge to it. And then you get interference patterns beyond 
So here, I hope you can see, you've got those repeating fringes of the pink and the purple and the green. And again, it doesn't look like a rainbow because it's these very specific colours. It's interference patterns and it's all the forward scattering of that light coming through the mist and being forward scattered and those light colours interfering with each other to produce these fringes called coroni. And you can see it most clearly from the moon. You can see it from the sun, though again, you have to block out the light of the sun and you have these... You have the aureole in the middle, which is that, that forward scattered white light around the sun, and then you get these fringes of colour around the outside. Now, again, you don't notice it because you don't look towards the sun. It's much easier to see in the night sky. But you might see patches of it where this coroni is actually played out on a cloud quite away from the sun. You get patches of iridescent colour on that cloud, and it's just part of this coroni far out and a long way from the sun. And every so often you just catch this patch and it's not a rainbow colour, it's these iridescent pinks, purples and greens. And a similar effect can be seen from the other side of the sun. So this is forward scattering to get the corona. If you turn around and look in the opposite direction at the anti-solar point, you can have back scattering, which produces a fainter but similar effect. If you have a mist of, of uh, water or fog that's on the other side of you from the sun. And the best place to see this is on an aeroplane. Sit on the opposite side of the sun, uh, opposite side of the plane to where the sunlight is going to be coming in, and you, get, you look on the up, onto the projection of this light onto the clouds below you. And you can see, again, the shadow of the aeroplane is surrounded by this expanding uh, clouds. These are called glories. And they can be very precise. Again, they're very particular to the observer. You can even work out more or less where in the plane I'm sitting to get this particular glory. And these are very commonly seen from aeroplanes. If you're a keen hill walker and there's mist and cloud rising up behind you and sunlight coming in, these can also be seen. And they lend themselves not just to this glory, but there's a particular thing where it's combined with your shadow. Your shadow is stretched from perspective. And you have something called a Brocken spectra. You get your, your distorted shadow because the sun's low down, surrounded by the glory. And it, it's, it's a phenomenon that's well known to hill walkers, in, especially in the Alps, where you get this particular effect within these conditions. And there's one last scattering effect, which it can be very easily observed. If there's a dew on the grass, it's called the heligenschein or the holy light. And again, it's a scattering effect from the dew, dop, dew drops that turns the sunlight round and back towards you. Now, dewdrops are hanging from leaves. Now, the water from the sun will come in. It'll be, the little dewdrop will act as a lens. It'll bring the light to a focus. And normally, the light would sort of carry on on its way. But if it just hangs, you know, that this, a certain size of dewdrop will produce a focus a certain distance behind the dewdrop. If it's hanging from a leaf, the leaf will reflect that light back through the lens and it will turn it around towards the observer. Um, obviously through a range of angles because these aren't perfect lenses so you get a dispersion of light that appears around your head and so you can see here just that kind of slight glow and again it's dependent on the observer this observer now moves the camera to one side and takes a picture of the heligan shine from the camera you can see the heligan shine is moved across to the camera you can see this from dewdrops. You can see it also on the moon it's not the only effect that's producing this there's also a lack of shadows but you can see around the astronaut's shadow and silhouette, you've got just this glow. And of course, it's not water drops on the moon, but these little glassy beads that are contained within the lunar soil that are going to act in the same way to turn the light around towards you. And you've also got a fact that you don't see many shadows when you look in front, so it appears brighter. But a lot of this is the heligan shine. So that's produced by water droplets. But then... If water droplets are embedded in our atmosphere, by the time you get up to 10, 15 kilometres up, it's freezing. You get temperatures of minus 40 degrees and you get ice crystals within the clouds. And ice crystals high up in the troposphere can produce some of the most spectacular atmospheric phenomena that we see at all. Now, ice crystals are a very regular hexagonal shape. What, so the cross section is the same. What varies is the length of the crystal. You can have very flat plate-like crystals, crystals. You can have much more sort of uh, pencil-shaped, long columnar crystals. And here you have a very particular symmetry which produces very predictable results. So the light can enter through the crystals 
many different directions. And you get a variety of directions according to which side it's entering into and which side it's coming out. And sometimes it's reflected, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's dispersed. And there are three key angles within this hexagon. So light can enter perhaps through one of these vertical faces and you've got an angle between the vertical face and the horizontal face that's 90 degrees. So between the, the vertical side and the horizontal top and vice versa of a crystal, you have a 90 degree prism. That will disperse light. You have, if light comes into this side, it moves across to the alternating side. These meet at 60 degrees and that's your standard 60 degree prism, which also disperses light. Or light could come in and it could go through this, this side and then this side, that's an angle of 120 degrees. And there you get a total internal reflection, which doesn't disperse the light, but it redirects it and changes it around. And so you have lots of ways that light rays can interact with these crystals to produce predictable effects. What does vary is the size of the crystal, the depth of the crystal, and sometimes the ends have got sort of a hexagonal prisms, which can also produce very particular effects. It also depends how well all the crystals are aligned with each other. So sometimes you can imagine you've got air currents or you've got clouds which are falling through the sky. You get air resistance, you get drag, and that acts to align all the crystals with each other. So these flat plate crystals will all align so that their flat surfaces are all downwards. It's like leaves falling through the sky. And so they'll align with each other sometimes. The column crystals will align so that they're their, le their longer side is down as well. So you can get these crystals aligned, you can get them not aligned, and they'll produce different effects. And of course, these change all the time because the temperature can change within, you know, the crystals can not only move through the sky, but they can melt, they can freeze, they can change shape, they can change size, and so you get changes even as you observe these phenomena. So the most common of these is a halo. Again, it hasn't come out very well here, but here's the sun. You're seeing it through a thin, icy mist of cloud. You know, get it a lot this time of year. And the light is dispersed into a halo around the sun. And it's very easy to know if you've seen this one. You put your thumb on the sun, and you put your hand out at, arm, at arm's length, put your thumb on the sun, and where your little finger is, that should be where the halo is. It's 22 degrees out from the sun. And it comes at that predictable angle because you have lots of ice crystals, random orientations every which way, and you have a very particular light path through the crystal. So it comes in one side, is refracted, and then goes out the alternate side. And if this angle's 60 degrees, the light that would have been coming in directly to you from the sun's path is now spread out through an angle of 22 degrees. So it's deflected across the sky. And because the crystals were randomly oriented, it goes all around the sun. And this is incredibly common. You see it every week. It's just as common as rainbows in our skies. So you have the 22 degree halo. And you can see it around the sun. You can also see it around the moon. And there's a very faint dispersion of colors. You see it better in the sun. You have the inner red edge and the bluer outer edge. You tend to get less of the color dispersion visible with the moon. Now, again, it hasn't really come out in this projection, but on this um, photo, there's also a fainter ring. I can see it's around there because I know it's there, right? I can see it on my screen here. Maybe you just have to take my word, but then twice a uh, bit further out, there's another, there's another halo of 46 degrees. And this is produced by the same ice crystals, but the light's going through a different angle. Remember, they're all our random orientations. Some have gone in alternate and come out alternate sides. Other ones will come in through the 90 degree prism. So they come in one of the horizontal vertical sides and get diffracted twice. But here they're dispersed through a much wider angle. So again, you would be looking at the sun, but instead the light is being dispersed into a 46 degree, much wider halo. And these tend, because the light's been dispersed over a wider ring, these tend to be a lot fainter than the inner halo. But you, again, you can be quite lucky and see two halos in the sky. But of course, it doesn't stop there. Imagine you've got the same process that produces the 22 degree halo, but now all your crystals are perfectly aligned. Then you get a very, very common phenomenon called sun dogs. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't really come out, but what I want to show you is that the sun is here, maybe just here, okay? And over here, you can see little patches of rainbow in the sky. These are called sun dogs, and, you know, I saw some brilliant ones in Cambridge just on Sunday. They, they're, they're very common. 
They can be much brighter than the halo. They're at exactly the same height as the sun, and they're 22 degrees away from the sun to either side. And sometimes you don't see them on one side, you just see them on the other because there isn't any cloud in the way. But they're little patches of rainbow, red in the centre, and then this diffuse blue tail that stretches off. And these are because you have this alignment of all the crystals. And so if the sunlight, you see the sun directly, and then you see all the sunlight that's gone through the 60 degree prism, and it produces, it's concentrated just at that, those, all the light gets concentrated from all these aligned crystals at this particular light path to give you the sun dogs. And <clears throat> you can see sun dogs, you can also see, uh, well again, you can see them, this is a fine mist in the air. You can also see them from the moon. Oop. There we are, moon dogs. Again, not so much colour apparent from them. And they look just like rainbows, but they're just little patches of colour to either side of the sun. And again, I'm willing to bet many of you have seen them in the sky and haven't really necessarily thought about what you're seeing. And you know, now's the time of year where it's prime conditions to see them. But of course, ice crystal displays don't end there. You can have other paths through the crystals. And you can get combinations of the sun dogs along with the 22 degree halo you can have something called a circumzenithal arc here's one we photographed in cambridge a couple of years ago and to all intents and purposes a lot of people will look at it and think yeah it's a rainbow if you're really observant you notice it's on the same side of the sky as the sun and it's upside down okay it amazes how many people don't actually appreciate that it's not a rainbow you're looking at it's caused by light coming in through one of the flat sides of the crystal and coming out the side and being dispersed in a particular way. And so you get, it's much higher than the sun, you get this circumzenithal arc because it's going around the sun and it just looks like an upside down, crisp, um, upside down rainbow. And then if the light path is reversed, you get a circum horizontal arc. Again, it doesn't really come out, but you've got the halo. And just down here, you have a very low, just skirting the horizon, you have this other arc and that's quite rare. And both of these are quite rare, rare arcs. And then, of course, combine these, if you're really lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have not seen this. <laughs> I've not seen this combination. But here is, uh, this is a recent photo that just was before the hurricane came in across the northern states. Very particular atmospheric conditions, ice crystals. You get all these different rays of light. So you can spot the circumzenithal arc. You can spot the sun dogs. You can spot the 22 degree halo. You can spot the 46 degree halo. But there are other features. There's the parahelic circle, which is a much wider one. You've got um, the 46 degree arc. You've got a tangent arc. You get these multiple displays. And there are some fantastic pictures that are taken from the South Pole, where you have brilliant sunshine and you know, fabulously clear air with just a screen of ice crystals producing a whole myriad of complex halo effects. And these are incredibly rare, so if you ever see one of these, really do appreciate what it is you're seeing. <laughs> and then one final thing is that I've talked about refraction, light rays passing through the crystals. You do just get a very simple effect of reflection. Imagine all these oriented flat plate crystals, and they're just slightly tilted, or perhaps tilted like that. So you have the sunlight down there. The sunlight comes up reflects off the flat side and gets directed towards you. And this is where you get these pillars of light. Here's one I just photographed in Lyme Regis. It's not quite as spectacular as this one. But you get a column of light just above the setting sun, and it's the same colour as the sun, same width as the sun. It can be quite transitory, just last a few minutes, and you just get this huge shaft of light heading up into the sky. And again, it's a fantastic phenomenon to see, and it's just your tilted ice crystals reflecting the light, and it, even more rarely, the ice crystals can be below the sun, and if they're tilted that way, they'll reflect the light, and you get a pillar that extends down below the sun. And again, those are very unusual, and they're quite spectacular to see, and they can extend several degrees up into the sky. And then, of course, you don't just get ice crystals high in the sky. If you live somewhere really cold, like Canada or Alaska, you will get freezing fall conditions where the ice crystals are much lower to the ground. And then they don't just reflect the sunlight, but any artificial sources of light. So here's a picture where, or I think this is a skating rink, if I remember right, and you've got all the different uh, colours of light, again, forming these, these, these crystal pillars above the light sources. So I hope you've enjoyed 
uh, seeing or some of the phenomena you can see, I do encourage you to go out and look for them. December's a great time. The sun is low in the sky. Sunrise and sunset are happening at much more appreciable, you know, much more easily appreciated times. You should be able to see many of these these phenomena, and I wish you luck with your atmospheric phenomena spotting. And it only remains for me to wish you a happy Christmas. <laughs>